Keith, um, so in, like, now we're going to talk about part two of the Mad Trapper, Ultimate Badass, Ooh. Albert Johnson. Before we dive straight in, um, you know, what's going on? Oh, yeah. Hey, by the way, hey, you and welcome. <laughs> sure, like, introduce yeah. the podcast. Um, hey, you and welcome. My name is Mike, and I'm joined once again by my co-host extraordinaire, Keith. Hello, Hello Keith. Hello. Thanks for uh, being here. Of course. I could do the pot alone, but I actually kind of hate doing it by myself because it's so boring. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like, just you're just talking gonna, to yourself. You just talk yourself. Room. It's like, this is actually a lot of fun and a bit of crack. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, what's the, what crack have you, what's the crack? What are you up to? Eh, I think my daughter might be a serial killer. So, that's something. Well, color me mother heckin' intrigued, boy. <laughs> or, like, she's not, obviously not a serial killer, boy. I think, like, she's, she's starting off. She's getting there. Nice. There was, we, nice. so we were, I was in the kitchen. Um, just pottering away she was in the playroom kind of doing her own thing playing away and then she came into the kitchen she called me in she was like yeah dada I wanna... she's three years old by the way she's like dada I want to show you something like, yeah okay severed so, head <laughs> <laughs> so came into the room and she's like I want to show you something it's like alright so she brought me over to her uh, Barbie Dreamhouse thing which has like a fridge in it and she's like you want to see this I was like okay then she opened the fridge and inside the fridge was a decapitated Barbie with no clothes on. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Where's the head? And then she looked me dead in the eyes and just pulled the head out of her pocket <laughs> and lifted it up. By the hair? And by the hair. I was like, you like that? <laughs> like what you see? She's a, yeah, a bit, bit, bit of a creep. I think that's pretty funny, though. Yeah. She had like a big shitting grin on her face the whole time. Oh, she was a lighter to oh, herself. She, yeah, she thought, this, she thought this was the funniest thing ever. She was like cracking up laughing. And you know what? That was pretty funny. It was pretty funny, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you also don't want to encourage that behavior. So. Uh, well, you know. I was laughing. I was like, don't do it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't do it. Wink, wink. Yeah. <laughs> and how's the house? Well, there you go. Okay. Strike four for your house. Or perhaps even five. I've lost count. Your daughter is turning into a killer. This is Amityville. Yeah. Off the bat. I'm sleeping with one eye open, buddy. Mott's graves in the room. Oh, yeah. Mott, yeah. Mott You're almost out. dying by uh, your innocent game of drinking wine in the shower. Who knew? And uh-huh. now your three-year-old daughter is becoming Damien from The Omen. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So okay. scary. Yeah. What's, what what's next? next? What's next? Who knows? Who knows? Tune, Tune in folks. next week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For another story from Keith Haunt today. You know, I haven't even been to your house yet. I know. What is Can with you believe that, this fucking cocksucker? He hasn't even talked to me, taken me to his house yet. I haven't invited you down loads of times. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you know, you haven't invited me enough. Actually, I have your old couch there, though. You do? I do. Oh, yeah, you do. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. That's probably what it's yeah. So I have, I have a party you there, I guess. Yeah, ah, I feel, I do feel like I've been in your house. All right. That's probably where your house is haunted. Yeah, can okay. catch, can't get rid of that stain. Yeah, <laughs> and nor do I want you to. <laughs> But uh, yeah, all right, folks, are you ready? Are you rocking and you're ready? Um, I hope wherever you are listening to this, perhaps with earphones in, if you're listening to this with earphones in, math noises. <laughs> uh, otherwise, on the speaker, you probably didn't hear that. So hope you're just chilling and getting ready for the Mad Trapper part two. And when I say getting ready, here we go. <laughs> I don't know what else to say with that. Buckle up, boy, because it's, uh, it's a good one. So in part one of the story of Albert Johnson was the siege the year was 1931, and Albert Johnson, just a guy who just wanted to be gosh darn heck and left alone. But the RCMP, those boys, by the way, <laughs> cut across, do I say or, like the letter or, weird, because I always get comments about it. I think it's all Irish people, like or, like I, I, I say or. 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 Am I supposed to say R? RC? Yeah. RCMP? RCMP? Yeah, that sounds weird. That no. sounds weird to me. I don't like it. Or CMP. Yeah. Okay, so let's stick with Okay, good. You know what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> fuck you. you know what we're talking about. That's... All right. So, yeah. Um, so Albert Johnson was living in his little cabin on Rat River in the far northwest territories, and he just wanted to be left alone. But rumors from the locals about him led the RCMP to knock on his door to question him if he'd been upsetting the locals. Albert Johnson didn't take too kindly to being questioned, uh, to the point where he refused to answer any questions. Well, they, they did they did approach during, like, around Christmas time. Someone you're not expecting to call around Christmas. No. That's never any fun. Maybe he you thought know? they were Santa Claus. Who knows? Uh, they didn't bring presents. Hey, <laughs> listen, joke's on them, really. Come on, if you're going to somebody's house at Christmas time, you have to bring a present. At least bring a bottle of wine, come on. Did they come in through the roof? Did oh, they, hold the they roof? did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're wearing red. Mm, <laughs> yeah. Very good. We're on to something. <laughs> so then uh, a siege of Albert Johnson's little cabin began, and he was locked. He was loaded. He had holes in the walls. He had built little trench fortifications. 
he had crazy guns in his house to the point where a posse who threw dynamite and exploded his cabin had to walk away with their tails tucked between their legs. That's how H and Hardcore, our boy, Ali John, <laughs> was. So now the posse was coming back for him, and this time, I think they were going to take him dead. Not alive, but dead. But he'd gone. He'd escaped. The border with Alaska, only a couple of hundred kilometers away, he was going to make a break for the border to escape into the United States. But the RCMP were determined to catch him before he left Canada. And let's pick up from there. Hot on the wild man's trail, Inspector Eames recruited a further 11 men from a camp in the area of the town of Aklavik. By the way, when I say town of Aklavik, I mean, even today, almost 100 years later, it's a couple of shacks in the middle of nowhere. Think, um, you know, life below zero, port protection, one of these discovery channels where they're like, go to these places, how do people survive in the middle of nowhere? Think that when you're thinking of where we're talking about. The expanded posse continued to pursue Johnson, and it was around January 31st that an article published in the Hudson's Bay Post first gave Albert Johnson the nickname The Mad Trapper. The name stuck, and the idea of Johnson being driven insane by the circumstances he'd been living in became the default story in the media and among the public. Eames knew better, having seen what Johnson was capable of. He was far from the insane, and he was very, very dangerous. The expansion of the posse's numbers, however, didn't last long. Everybody and their mother wanted to hunt down old Al. The demanding train and the swollen numbers of the posse were constantly wearing on the group's supplies. This is in the middle of winter, minus 40 degrees. You can't take a lot, and what you do have has got to last. If Eames didn't reduce the men, they'd be in danger of running out of their supplies completely. So almost as quickly as he had recruited them, Eames dismissed 11 tribesmen and began to plan how to streamline the group even further. Sorry, boys. It's not you, it's me. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. Like, I can't imagine they were too upset either, uh, being let go. Like, I, like, oh, no, I don't get yeah. to go out in the frozen wilderness to chase a madman. No, After oh, probably no. We just wanted to look tough in front of our wives. Then we're like, oh, thank God, I actually don't have to hunt down this <laughs> madman. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. It actually, like, it was a pretty big blow to the team, though, because some of the men he had let go, they were seasoned trappers from the area, and some of them were hardened veterans who had seen action in World War One. Mm. Like these guys, they were like they're the guys you want on your team. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Remember uh, the year what nineteen thirty one, uh, or is it? So the year is nineteen thirty two because he arrived in the area in thirty one. Thirty one, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I think I said thirty two there previously. So Regina, when you were editing this, I'm going to say nineteen thirty two, nineteen thirty two, nineteen thirty two. So I just you know, <laughs> cut one of them, put it in there, make it. Yeah, exactly. or I'll say nineteen thirty two. Fit that in somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just have Keith yeah, yeah, say yeah. it like. 1932. The year was 1932. Constable Millen was the only man who could actually identify Johnson. When he had arrived back in 1931, he was the only person who had spoken to him. So him, along with three other men, were chosen to keep up the chase. They would be the advance party. This mini posse had the advantage of being able to move considerably faster than before and made much better time in their pursuit. The pursuers first tried staking out Johnson's canoe and stasher supplies they'd found hidden nearby his destroyed cabin. But Johnson didn't show. Eventually, the group split into two pairs and combed the area around Rat River. The heavy snowstorms had wiped out any trace of tracks Johnson might have left, so the men were essentially guessing where he could have gone, and there's a lot of places he could have gone. Then they caught a break when they spotted light tracks that had been left by Johnson's snowshoes. They realized that what Johnson was doing was moving in a Z pattern, circling back so he could keep an eye on his followers, which again, harkens back to what I said in the first episode. Mm. That's like military yeah. stuff. He knew what he was doing. He was trained. Definitely trained. He was getting very close to the Alaskan border, and if he got there, he would be out of reach. Luckily for them, they got another break when they came across a local who told them he'd heard two gunshots in the distance and he pointed them in the direction. Millen and the others correctly assumed that this was likely Johnson trying to replenish his supplies for a last dash across the finish line into the United States. They soon found more of Johnson's distinctive snowshoe prints. The group once again split into pairs and forked off in order to cover more ground and make sure Johnson would be cut off if he tried to move in the Z like before. I often walk in 
Zed Varens, but it's usually when I'm coming home from the pub. <laughs> That's very, very true. I've seen it done. It's a work of art. It's like a ballet. <laughs> yeah. and he's graceful, like a gazelle, <laughs> like a gazelle. <laughs> as he sways from two back and forth ever. <laughs> couple of too many Guinness, yeah. but who hasn't been there before? <laughs> it's covering my tracks. That's Singing, all I'm doing. having a great time. That's all I'm doing. He's, he's having a good time. Who's to stop him? But it really does, as, as you mentioned, like it really indicates that Johnson did in fact possess the training in either tracking or evading pursuit. And he also, another thing he did as well was he followed caribou trails, which is a really effective way of disguising your own tracks. Mm. Mm. But... Uh, yeah, I guess it just really highlights just how hyper vigilant he was. Yeah. Not like mad trapper, as the paper suggests. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't just, he, he was clearly thinking and planning out everything he did. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't just, you know, ah, sure, you know, faffing about. He dug defenses. He knew they were coming. He was waiting for them. He was ready. And then when he was making his escape, he wasn't just making a mad dash. He was like, he was calculated. Calculating yeah. everything. If you really wanted to cover his tracks, he should have rode on the caribou. Ooh, that's a good idea. Right? Tame one. I'm sure it's very easy to just throw... If it's anything like Red Dead Redemption 2, just throw a rope <laughs> on it, press Z a couple of times, or press B or X or whatever, and then you've tamed it. You can ride off on it. Don't dust it. Exactly. Easy. And speaking of not knowing exactly who this mysterious man running across the country was, how about not knowing who you are? Uh, I do. Um, well, unless you're using NordVPN, of course, then kind of out of guesses. In this day and age of constant security breaches, NordVPN is the best in the business at keeping your online activity safe and sound so you can snore at night. I know you! Hey listen, I do too, it's nothing to be ashamed about. Nord has the very best VPN around, allowing you to virtually be anywhere in the world. I, li I personally use it all the time because of those heckin' can't access this content in your location messages. With one single click, Nord says, in you get. Cybersecurity these days is the name of the gosh darn game, and that is where Nord shines with its, with its protection systems like Nord's MeshNet, which allows you to safely access other connected devices no matter where they be at. Essentially, it acts like a local area network, only you don't need to have wires to connect your devices or even be local. <laughs> Look at that! And now that it's back to school season, Nord has a very special deal just for you. Yeah, you listening right now. I asked if I could have it even, they said no. They said no only to my listeners. Using my special link, nordvpn.com slash tcpodcast, you can get an incredible deal. Every purchase of a two-year plan will receive a bonus four months for free. You can get that only using the link nordvpn.com slash tcpodcast. A heck an extra four months for free? Game and of course, Nord has data scanners. Or how about threat protection, preventing any malicious internet beings from nabbing you? Undocking malware advising, phishing attacks, no phishing rod involved in those, my friends. Ransomware, stealing your IP address and then doing naughty things with your address. Nord is your all in one, got your back, daddy. So once again, please use my special link that is nordvpn.com slash TC podcast and you can get an exclusive deal that is just for you and hey, listen, Nord are so good, they have a 30 day money back guarantee, so you know you're in safe hands. Thank you NordVPN for sponsoring this old podcast, now let's get back to the story. So the posse, the mini posse, soon came upon the remains of a caribou. No doubt Johnson had shot the animal and packed it away to stock up on food, so they must be close. In fact, they were only a few kilometers away from Johnson. They also realized after a few hours of pursuit, that Johnson seemed to be circling back on himself. That meant they could cut him off and catch him at last. Then, they got their biggest break yet when they spotted a thin, continuous plume of smoke that meant they'd located Johnson's camp. They watched into the late hours to make sure he didn't leave before heading back to find the rest of the gang and make a plan of attack for the morning. The mini posse, four people, they woke up early to minus 40 degree weather and a blizzard. It was the ninth day of their pursuit. It was now or never if they were going to take Johnson in. Johnson had found himself a deep canyon filled with brush and surrounded by plenty of natural defenses. The last thing the posse wanted was another standoff because that went so well the first time, especially if there's only four of them now. Fortunately, they had the element of surprise this time and managed to stealthily, covert-like, sneak around Johnson and partially surround and overlook him. That is when their luck ran out and one of the men slipped and Johnson reacted immediately. 
slow motion again because Johnson does everything Matrix style, as we've already covered. Yeah. Gun in each hand, mm -hmm. jumping. Yeah, exactly. Johnson grabbed his rifle and Millen heard him check the rifle and cough, but they still didn't know exactly where he was. Then the silence was broken and Johnson fired on Millen. Millen returned fire and ran for better cover. The four couldn't see Johnson, but returned blind fire, hoping one of them at least might wing him and give away his precise location. Johnson didn't fire again, however. For a moment, the men thought they'd hit him in their initial barrage. Two of them approached as the others provided cover, but then suddenly it was on. Johnson and the four engaged in an all-out firefight in the middle of this dense brush. They swapped bullets until Millen fell uh, belly down in the snow with his rifle beside him. This gunfight lasted two hours, by the way. It also involved uh, more dynamite. So, like, these lads were mad for the dynamite. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it just shows yeah. how well Johnson was ready to lock and load. That's it, yeah. That's four men against one, and he was still taking them on and would win. Millen would be hit in the heart by Johnson's rifle, dying there on the spot. The men knew they couldn't get Johnson out of his hole without risking more lives, so they pulled back to the camp. Johnson climbed the canyon, disappeared once again into the freezing night. So this canyon that Johnson climbed was basically a vertical cliff made of ice, and he managed to climb this. This man is a monkey! He climbed it at night in the middle of an Arctic storm with homemade snowshoes and zero visibility. So to this day, no one knows how we done it. Um, they haven't a clue. And to date, uh, I don't believe any other climber has made this climb even with modern equipment. So it's really like it's mind boggling that all of this is just unfolding in this extreme minus 40 temperatures. Uh, like he managed to navigate through seemingly impenetrable underbrush facing weather that even seasoned uh, First Nation hunters wouldn't dare to face. Yeah. And um, he was cleverly able to uh, use the terrain to outwit his pursuers at every turn. One seasoned trapper uh, actually said surviving those conditions alone is tough enough, let alone being on the run. Yeah, man, he's amazing. He's not like, don't get me wrong, like he's Johnson. He's so cool. He, he's a bad, like, don't get me wrong, he's a stone blooded killer. But, or well, a cold I mean, blooded killer. In, but in fairness, though, they did come for him first. He just wanted to be left. I, I'm firmly on Albert Johnson's side, by the way. But Folks, he, let me know. <laughs> I'm in camp, Johnson. He just wanted to be left alone. He wanted to do his thing. Live out in the wilderness, bro. Be one with nature. Have a little tuggy out under the forest <laughs> canopy. He was having a great time. And then. The man, the fucking government shows Come on up. Come on down. I truly believe Johnson was cool. He ruled. And uh, he's honestly, well, listen, we'll get there. In fairness, he was pretty badass. There yeah. was one, there was another one. There was another local native. And he said at one point in the chase, uh, Johnson could uh, snowshoe two miles for every one mile a dog team had to break trail. This man's amazing. Like, I, he must have seen seemed like supernatural to the man yeah. at this point. Like he'd already... Ooh. Ooh. Is this story Ooh. supernatural? Let's talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about ghosts. Okay. <laughs> He's a ghost. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 Ghost of Albert Johnson. Well, he kind of is a ghost. But he is now, yeah. Well, he does. Uh, spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the guy, this happened a hundred years ago. So. <laughs> yeah. of like, guys, can I shock you? He's dead. <gasps> But I mean, he's a ghost in the fact that nobody knows where he's from. Nobody knows his real name. Nobody knows anything about him. Yet he managed to make the horse CMP look like chumps and did superhuman feats of uh, superhumanness. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. I'm naming him for son, Albert. Yeah. <laughs> Honor you, baby. Yeah. Oh, we don't know that if that was his name, though. Oh, Just call your son the Mad Trapper. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mad Trapper. Get off the wall. Yeah, exactly. Come in for your dinner. Yeah, exactly. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> The kids can call you trappy. Call Matt. Come on. <laughs> we gotta go one. By the 1st of February, the news of Millen's death at the hands of the Mad Trapper was everywhere, all over the newspapers and radio stations. Volunteers from miles around joined the team at Aklavik and helped with the search. Eames knew he needed a sizable posse to go after the wily Johnson. He's, I think he's kind of coming back to the whole thing. He's like, no, I need a small posse because we need to move fast and have yeah. those food. And he's like, fuck it, bring everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, bring them all. Johnson, keeping quiet, trapping small animals to sustain himself and could go indefinitely. Eames put out a call to any able-bodied, big-dicked men in the area to bring their guns and whatever they could to help gather and find them. 
The newly assembled team included locals, lawmen, military men. They were pulling at all the stops this time. In addition to the use of two-way radios, two-way radios for communication and a manhunt, first time it's ever been used, by the way, well, first time in Canada anyway, Eames made another first in Canadian legal history when he called in an aeroplane to be used in locating Johnson. On February 2nd, while waiting to find out if his request for a plane would be accepted by the top brass, Eames set out to meet up with his newly assembled posse. Later that day, he received confirmation that a plane was indeed being sent. Everyone and their mothers was now taking Albert Johnson very seriously, as they should. Though confirmed, it would still take time to get the logistics sorted. In the meantime, the pursuit continued with the manpower they had. All of this... He's only killed one person. He's shot another person. He's only killed one person. He's kind of done nothing wrong, really, at this point. <laughs> That's a bold statement. I mean, like. you know, for what they've done to him. <laughs> I, st- I think he was genuinely, like, in self-defense. I would I self-defense. Think, yeah. I think, like, anyone else, I don't think it would have been as many men. But I think the fact that he seemed to be, like, in I say, like, Keith. dynamite. They drew first blood <laughs> over here. They started. They he, started. he drew first blood. Oh, uh, yeah, he did. Well, they, yeah, against a man who was wielding an axe trying to knock down his door. They knocked first blood. Yep. <laughs> well, whatever. Moving on. Moving on. We'll, we'll talk about this later. Okay, okay. <laughs> Back to your cage. Shut up, dog! The pursuit continued anyway with all the man pair they had. All in all, the posse hunting Albert Johnson was now roughly 17 people strong. On February 5th, the posse made it to the scene of Millen's death and they discovered Johnson had long since fled. The posse split into smaller groups and fanned out to cover a larger area. Over the next three days, the team found various fresh and much more intact tracks made by Johnson and they were hot on his trail once again. They also realized he'd been circling back over his own tracks. Now, the posse determined that Johnson was heading for the Richardson Mountains, which is a lifeless stretch of terrain that no one could survive. Johnson, he was simply going there because he had no other choice. With all the people chasing him, it was the one place he could go. He did not think they would follow him. You like this. So the Richardson Mountains was named after Sir John Richardson who had accompanied uh, Sir John Franklin on his first two overland explorations of the Canadian Arctic. Wow, and Sir John, John Franklin, yes. Yeah, he's the one who captained the uh, HMS uh, Erebus and uh, HMS Terror. Yes. On their doomed expedition. Their doomed, the Franklin expedition, which did not go so well for John Franklin. No, no, no. Either they turned to cannibalism, which is kind of like widely believed when they tried to find the Northwest Passage, or I like to go with... They encountered a native First Nations uh, magical bear that sucked their souls out, like in the TV show. Oh, okay, yeah. Nice. Real life cannibalism or magic bear? I'm gonna go magic bear magic, every time. Yeah, yeah, magic bear every time. Yeah. <laughs> Much more interesting than they just starved to death. <laughs> That's so sad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is just that. But he was now going to trek over one of the most desolate places on Earth with dwindling supplies. But, you know, the fact he survived this long was a testament to his experience and natural, physical, and mental resilience. Or unnatural. Mm. Finally, Eames' request for air support was granted and everything was in place, including a great old pilot, Wilfred Wop. <laughs> that sounds a bit, like, dodgy, to be honest. <laughs> uh, May was a... I am pronouncing that right. It's spelled W-O-P. Yeah, uh, well, that's how I would say. Wop, yeah. Well, okay, if there's any Italians listening, uh, sorry about that. But that was his name. <laughs> so, uh, he was a world... I'll just call him Wilfred for now. Uh, was a World War One flying ace and the last man to be pursued by the infamous Red Baron when the Baron was shot down and killed. Wilfred had gone on to shoot down many enemy fighters and earned several medals for his service in World War I. And now he was going to be flying over the Richardson Mountains looking for any sign of Albert. Canada had declared war on Albert Johnson. Several times members of the search party found remnants of one of Johnson's camps, but every time there was no sign of him, just distinctive snowshoe prints leading in the direction of an impassable mountain range. The men were constantly battling against dense fog and freezing conditions. Even the innovative use of radios for fast communications was impeded by these sub-40 degree conditions. Vital components of the radio systems kept freezing and needed seemingly never-ending maintenance. 
it was coming down to nature versus technology and nature was winning. Nevertheless, Eames and his lawman sensed they were getting close. It's cold, isn't it? Mm. The coldest weather I've experienced was minus 18 degrees Celsius. Was that in, when you were in Canada? Yeah, when I lived in Toronto. And like, it's, it's no joke. The, mm. So I was in Toronto in 2013 when this massive ice storm hit. And uh, yeah, it was crazy. There was like freezing rain and snow that damaged electrical power and left like 600,000 people without electricity. It's really hard to describe what the cold is like. But when you're out in it, you can feel like your nose hairs freeze. Yeah. And your wow. eyelashes freeze. I was coming home from work with icicles on my uh, my mustache and on my mm. beard. Uh, and then, like I was really only out in it walking from my house to the streetcar. So yeah. I just needed to get like a bit of a hustle on. Like, yeah. I wasn't like out in the elements elements. Mm. So I can only imagine what these men had to endure in like minus 40 degree conditions. Um, I was reading accounts from people who had experienced that type of weather. Yeah. Just sounds like pure unadulterated pain. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, like initially you get this like burning sensation on any exposed skin. But then after a few moments, the burning gives way to this like deep, dull ache. And it feels like it's just like radiating from your bones. And then frostbite on that on any exposed skin at that temperature can happen in as little as 10 minutes. 10 minutes, wow. Even just like breathing in can be painful because like you're breathing in a like cold air, this freezing, freezing cold air, like with icicles straight to your lungs. So if it's painful on your skin, it's going to be very painful on your exposed... In, inner skin. Yeah, <laughs> your lungs. Like, yeah. wow. So, fair play to these men. Fair play to the... Yeah, exactly. Like, I've never really experienced that cold. I've never been that far north, but yeah, like... I wasn't even that far north. I was in Toronto. Well, like, yeah, Toronto, it's... I know. It gets really, really <laughs> yeah. cold. Like, you're yeah. beside the lakes and stuff. The Great Lake, which, that's Lake Ontario, right? Yeah. But, I mean, you know, when it's, like, physically painful cold, mm. like, the wind is literally feels like knives going into you. I've only experienced that once or twice, and it's nay fun. Yeah, it was, it was cold. I remember we were in a, we were in the pub one of the times in Toronto, and they had, like, the weather report up, and it was, like, weather in different parts of, uh, of the like, GTA and stuff, but it had, like, Toronto with the weather. It also had the moon. <laughs> What the, the what temperature was on the moon? Comparison, and it was it was colder in Toronto <laughs> than the freaking moon. Like, <laughs> we just go there. I'm moving to the moon. <laughs> it is. So after a lot of kilometers traveled and nearly seven weeks fighting the elements, the fight would finally be coming to a violent crescendo. No matter how much Eames and his men suffered, they knew Albert would be far more depleted from the chase and the lack of rest and proper sustenance, so now was the time to strike. They better close in on him. Ironically, it's likely that had Eames not moved or continued to pursue even any further, the natural hostile elements would have taken care of Albert Johnson on their behalf. But Eames wanted Johnson to face justice at the hands of the law. Whether that justice come at the end of a rifle or the hangman's noose, that would be Albert's choice, but he was coming in dead or alive. The fateful day would be Wednesday, February 17th, 1932. In the days leading up, the posse had only been a matter of hours behind Johnson, stopping every so often to place markers to provide landmarks and help guide May, who was flying overhead. The various teams continuously exchanged the lead position and swapped what they knew of what was coming up. Now, tracking was difficult, with large herds of caribou in the area trampling the snow, but this also made it easier for the men to travel quickly, so they gained time. Eames met up with the other teams and began erecting a marker, when suddenly, they saw one of the men in the distance, Staff Sergeant Earl Hersey, grab his rifle from his toboggan sled and take off for the opposite side of the river. He'd been with the search party for weeks, and now something had clearly caught his eye. Hersey had been heading one of the teams when he'd spotted the figure of a man in the distance. When he realized he'd been spotted, the figure had grabbed his rifle and headed for the cover of the densely packed tree line, using the raised bank of a bend in the river for temporary protection. Hersey knew it must be Johnson. Though Hersey had lost sight of Johnson, he headed for the opposite bank in order to try and flank him, get around him, and stop him from being able to flee. It was fast thinking on the staff sergeant's part. It wouldn't be long before numbers were reinforced, but they needed to make sure they kept Johnson pinned down till at least then. They all knew full well just how dangerous Johnson actually was, and how able and capable he was of evading even the best trackers. The party spread out on both banks of the river, creating a pincer-like movement and attempting to squeeze Johnson out. But no one had even seen him since Hersey first caught a glimpse of him. They just presumed 
he was in this area. Just then, Johnson made a vital and fatal mistake. The only mistake he made during this entire trip. Johnson opened fire despite the searchers not having any sight of him. He gave away his own position and that enabled Hersey, who was closest, to return fire in Johnson's direction. There was no precision, just firing from the hip. He'd previously been moving for the top of the bank in an effort to try and overlook his pursuers. And if he had made it, if he had continued going before opening fire, it would have given him a huge advantage and likely led to the deaths of several of his hunters. Once again, there would be an intense exchange of fire. And once again, it appeared fate was on Johnson's side. It's crazy how much ammunition he had to keep having these gunfights. Oh yeah. This is the second gunfight uh, while on the run. While on the run, not counting the original gunfight, gunfight which yeah. went on for days. He was dragging a... Johnson, he, he'd been dragging a toboggan with his bedroll, two rifles, sawn off shotgun, and more than 100 rounds of ammunition along with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like for each only, weapon. Yeah. yeah, like not only was he just like out in like, like these crazy elements, he was like dragging a, a full arsenal uh, behind yeah, him. Yeah, like, exactly. An army totally. behind He's him. like those guys in Tremors. He's ready to lock and load. <laughs> Hersey was shot and fell, and Johnson dropped into the snow, likely seeing the rest of the party approaching quickly. Johnson knew he was outnumbered, and that this would be his last stand. This time, he had no cover and a highly unfavorable position. Someone from the party called out to Johnson to surrender, telling him it was his last chance. Johnson's reply was a bullet, and the men exchanged brief but heavy fire. Captain May was overhead throughout the firefight and could clearly see Johnson lying prone in the snow. He could also clearly see the gun battle that was going on beneath him. He circled and circled and circled, unable to do anything except watch. When after a while, he realized Johnson wasn't moving. He circled again, flying in lower and lower, not fearing Johnson firing back anymore, and he managed to signal to the party that the fight was over, that Johnson had been neutralized. A scout moved ahead cautiously in case Johnson was playing possum and luring in a potential human shield. They wouldn't put anything past him at all. But in this case, there would be no sudden horror movie jump scare for the scout though as he waved back to his allies. The boogeyman was dead at last. Do, 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 <laughs> do, do, do. For the <laughs> listeners at home, I'm saluting Albert Johnson. Just want you to be aware of that. <laughs> Or IP. Rest in power, brother. There's a really good documentary I watched. Uh, it's called The Hunt for the Mad Trapper. It's produced by uh, Myth Merchant Films. Uh, so in the documentary, a team of forensic experts, they delve deep into the mystery of Albert Johnson, trying to identify by exhuming his skeletal remains. Uh, upon the examination, they concluded that the fatal shot that took down Johnson had struck him on the left side of his pelvis but the angle of the shot indicated that it came from behind. Passing through his lower abdomen and then causing damage to his, his bowels and his arteries, leading to a significant blood loss. The only man reported to have been positioned behind the trapper was Mission Special Constable John Moses. These special constables, they were uh, indigenous men who played like a really crucial role in mm. the RCMP, offering vital land skills and guidance and right. knowledge to the Mounties. Um, so yeah there you have it the, the Mad Trapper's demise resulted from a shot to the ass nice yeah <laughs> he took one for the team <laughs> he took one for the team yeah but uh, yeah. With him, man. after nice. this though uh, John Moses who shot him he threw away his gun mm, he killed a hero well yeah that was well I guess that could be one reason the main reason was he didn't want to hunt food for his family using a gun that had killed a human being ah. I wouldn't be bringing that gun Everywhere. Oh, I yeah. would have that attached what to me. I'd be point. like, yeah. in the pub. Hey, oh, guys, it is? Oh, it is? Check it out. <laughs> yeah. Guess who this killed? Yeah. I would have a would I'll be like, hey, uh, like, I'd be standing in the street, like, winking at girls as they walk by. Hey, oh, this? Yeah. Hey, it only killed Albert Johnson. It only killed the man. You want to touch my gun? Yeah. I would be, yeah, no, I what would. What about be. these guns? Yeah. Hey, I would, no, yeah, I definitely would have been like, keep that gun and be like, show her off. Now, no doubt the actions of the lawmen involved were heroic. Fine. And they were honoured, as such, after the resolution of the, of the chase. A lot of questions, though, remained after the hunt, with one being the main one. Who the fuck was Albert Johnson? After he was finally stopped at Eagle River, which is where the final gun battle took place, the investigation into Albert Johnson's origin began. Now, at the time of his death, 
It was found he had nothing that would indicate his identity on his body. He didn't have his driver's license, unfortunately for us. What he did have was an empty baking soda can attached to a cord around his neck. Inside was $2,410 in cash, including several uh, US uh, American notes. I might start keeping my money in a can around my neck. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. It doesn't look cool. <laughs> but, well, it depends on what type of can. He also had several small glass jars. Uh, one contained five pearls, another five pieces of gold dental work, and pieces of alluvial, which means that uh, he had pieces of gold, essentially, that were, that were panned from the river. He also had an axe, complete with a bullet hole in the handle, fishing hooks, sewing tread, and a pocket compass. A far more concern to the investigators, though, was finding out just how well armed Johnson had been. He clearly had no intention of going down peacefully. Along with the automatic 38 pistols he'd used to kill Millen, Johnson was also carrying a 3030 Model 99 Savage rifle, an Ivor sawed off shotgun, and a Winchester 22 repeater rifle. So he was pretty locked and loaded. Like, that's a lot of guns for one person. It's kind of like in, you know, in Grand Theft Auto, the way you can select your gun and you <laughs> yeah. just magically can have like yeah. a million guns on yeah. your video game character. He definitely had the cheat code. Back at the cabin where this all began, officers searched for clues as to his identity. Still came up empty though. When Johnson's body was returned, escorted by Inspector Eames, Eames took on the job of fingerprinting Johnson and passing on the prints to both Ottawa and Washington DC, hoping, hoping you know there may be some record of him either being somewhere in Canada, somewhere in the USA that would just give away who the shit he was, who they'd been at war with for the last two months. And nothing. Johnson's body was eventually buried in Aklavik, his grave marked by two stumps inscribed with his presumed initials, AJ. He was buried under a spruce tree in March of 1932 after no one came forward to claim the body. Here's a bit of a grim fact for you. Oh, hit me. So when they were putting Johnson's body into the coffin, by the time they had done it, it had frozen in such a way that it didn't fit. So the coffin maker's son, he recalls the cracking of bone <sighs> as men jumped on the lid of the coffin just to make it fit. Oh, nice. Squish up his body. Make it get in there. Just like kicking it. Now, it's hard to explain to frenzy that had been stirred up by the, uh, like in the newspapers over this madman who'd been on the loose. While there was actually little to no chance members of the public were ever in danger, but it still captured the nation. Johnson, who only wanted to be left alone. And it's only this intrusion into his life and self-imposed isolation that Johnson took up his... It was his desire to be left alone that led many to speculate that maybe, just maybe, Albert Johnson had in fact been a Chicago mobster who'd ran away with his criminal buddies who'd been in, you know, active during the prohibition and all that sort of stuff. Though his fingerprints didn't actually ring any alarm bells, probably ruled that out. Plus, he seemed far too experienced a woodsman and too able to survive. He probably wasn't a gangster. I imagine if he put Tony Soprano up there, he would die in like 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. So it's unlikely he was like in the mafia or in some kind of organized gang. This isn't the only time that stories of Chicago mobsters had run-ins with the RCMP. Mm. So in Saskatchewan, uh, there is this city called uh, Moose Jaw, where Canadian immigrants, they constructed tunnels back in the 1900s. Um, during the American Prohibition in the 1920s, it said that Al Capone, he discreetly stayed in Moose Jaw and utilised these tunnels to conduct his bootlegging operations. So the tunnels went under the border? No, they didn't go under the border. Oh, okay. They were just under the town, so he was kind of, he was under there. Um, just to avoid the law. Just to avoid a lot. Like, the rumor has it that there was functioning speakeasies uh, that were even hidden beneath the streets of Moose Jaw. Was there a pro... There wasn't prohibition in Canada, though. No, but I guess... So I what do you mean speakeasy? Yeah, it's like, you can just go to the pub, you know, it's legal here. Well, that's the thing. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's only, like, anecdotal evidence that oh, yeah. exists to support the claim of Al Capone's time in Moose yeah. Jaw. But, like, if you, if you go to, like, this, uh, to Moose Jaw on their website, like... They, they flog it like it's it's a real oh, yeah. tourist thing you get those tours down into the uh into these um the caves into you? these caves and like or into these tunnels you can oh. walk around like oh these this is where the speakies would have been al capone may have been here oh yeah well i mean you know uh, it's on my list of reasons to visit moose jaw it's probably number one uh because <laughs> yeah. i'm running out of other reasons to visit the town called moose yeah. jaw in the middle of saskatchewan <laughs> Now, many in the RCMP, especially those who'd come into direct contact with Johnson, agreed that Johnson knew how to move tactically 
as we were saying the whole time, and he was far too calm under heavy fire and comfortable in extreme circumstances to not have some kind of military experience or training at least. Perhaps from what had only happened, what, 15 years earlier? Dub Dub One. Am I right or am I right? No, you're definitely right. Thanks. <laughs> Great. I double checked. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for double checking that. I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> One of the primary theories came sometime in the August of 1933 when the RCMP got wind of the name Arthur Nelson. Now, this guy named Arthur Nelson had arrived in the Yukon area six years earlier, in August of 1927, four years before the name Albert Johnson was ever even heard. But this Arthur Nelson was said to have heavily resembled Johnson. Now, Nelson disappeared in the spring of 1931, right before Johnson first appeared at Fort McPherson and encountered Constable Edgar Millen. Now, I'm sure when Millen met Johnson, he'd had no idea that just a few weeks later he would be facing the man that would kill him. It was said now that Arthur Nelson spoke with a slight Scandinavian accent of some kind, though he would tell people he was from the USA and had been raised in North Dakota. A harsh winter had forced him to stay in British Columbia, after he'd spent some time working in the mines at Anyox, British Columbia. Nelson had camped on Ross River and spent some time there where he'd built himself a boat. Later, Nelson had sailed the river and shacked up at an abandoned cabin on Sheldon Lake while he was prospecting and trapping for fur. He returned to Ross River in June 1928 and moved on a month later. Around this time, Nelson had bought himself a 3030 Savage rifle, which was the exact same rifle Johnson would later have. Now, unfortunately, the manufacturer's records weren't available and the weapon couldn't be matched officially. But you have a guy who could possibly be Albert Johnson, and a lot of things about Arthur Nelson would show up for Albert Johnson. The biggest link between Johnson and Nelson being the same person was that two of the $50 bills that were found on Johnson's body at the time of his death, well, in August 1928, Nelson had been seen in Mayo, in the center of the Yukon, where he had sold a number of Martin skins for a total of $680, and two of those $50 bills on Johnson's body were traced back to the Bank of Montreal that had a branch in Mayo. Nelson had left Mayo but returned in the spring of 1931 where he stocked up on supplies, including some kidney pills. He then vanished in May 1931 after being seen in the town of Kino. Johnson just so happened to have a number of kidney pills in his possession when he died. There was a month between the last known sighting of Nelson and then Johnson arriving in Fort McPherson. So, could they be the same person? Maybe Johnson went into the wilds for a month when he reappeared. He decided to change his name for some reason. He decided he would now call himself Albert Johnson instead of Arthur Nelson. And they're very similar names. A-N, A-J, Albert, Arthur, Nelson, Johnson. He didn't exactly look the same as he did when he was Arthur Nelson, if he was indeed Arthur Nelson. Several people tried to identify the body from photographs, but no one could say for certain, as Johnson had been so thin, you know, through his ordeal of on the run for weeks, lack of food, nutrition at the time of his death. He weighed less than 150 pounds when he was killed, considerably less than the imposing man they'd first seen, seen at the cabin, so it's hard to say. Well, we'll never know. In that, um, in that earlier documentary I mentioned where they exhumed his skeleton, the Frenzy team, they made a truly jaw-dropping discovery. Oh, nice. I like that. <laughs> so Johnson, he had a gold bridge in his teeth and fillings. Oh. Um, that, like, that's quite an extravagant dental choice. Yeah. Um, and it kind of leaves us with more questions than answers. On one hand, the, like this fancy dental work suggests he may have come from wealth. Yeah. Lived in a, a large city where advanced dental procedures were common. However, on the other hand, like his exceptional survival skills uh, displayed like mountain man abilities. Mm, yeah. no, not what you expect. Like yeah. wh what he shown was like he was really on par with the indigenous people. Like, they, they could barely keep up with him. Yeah, exactly. Like a lot of the people chasing him were First Nations people. They knew that area. And then, like I was saying like earlier, one of them said that like he was like he could get ahead like faster than the, like the dog sleds. So it's just it's a strange combination that just doesn't seem to fit together. And I guess like still leaves the question, like who, who the fuck was Albert Johnson? Yeah. 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 Well, another uh, author, a guy named Dick North. <laughs> Keith, when I look at you, my dick face is North. <laughs> suggests that Johnson... What a was, name. Yeah, I know, it's pretty good. Suggests that Johnson was actually a man named John Johnny Conrad Johnson. John Johnny Johnson, whatever name. 
who would have been born in Norway but moved to North Dakota with his family when he was only six years old. Now, this John Johnson had served out several sentences in different county jails for various crimes, including armed robbery and theft of livestock. He moved to Canada in the summer of 1923 when he was 25 years old, and his family had no idea what would become of him, and they never saw him again. You know, he could have ended up to be Albert Johnson. And that's the story of the Mad Trapper of Rat River. The story of a wild man. A mysterious ultimate badass of a wild man, though, if you ask me. We'll never know why things went as so, you know, south as quickly as they did. Why it spiraled into the largest manhunt in the Arctic Canadian history. Why it all began. He just wanted to be gosh darn left alone. Millen was lost, but many things were gained in the pursuit. Namely, my respect for Albert Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> It, it was another thing, though. It dragged the Canadian police forces into the modern area. They had to use radios. They had to use air support in manhunts and investigations, and they would be used then going forward. And in fact, Hersey's, uh, you know, when he was shot, that he would survive, by the way, uh, you know, that would bring x-rays uh, to the forefront of, of medical examinations and that sort of stuff. Now, so, uh, you know, it was a dark time for the people in the area, but authority, but, uh, you know, a lot of uh, valuable lessons were learned. And uh, yeah. There you go. Final thoughts on the Mad Trapper of Rat River. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned uh, that this situation dragged the Canadian police uh, forces into the modern era. Um, they really did have to quickly adapt to the circumstances from like the very out- outset. Like the RCMP had been established only in 1920, and then this extraordinary series of events took place in 1931. So they were still, I guess, like sort of a relatively new service mm. uh, when they were suddenly like plunged into this intense and chaotic manhunt so yeah i guess like it's just it's an amazing story a very unnecessary story i think uh like as i said before this all started with johnson just not answering his door yeah like i hate answering my door oh uh, i do too i think I'm i'll uh, debating shooting next time somebody right, asks my door yeah. so i think i'll uh, I, I, might, I might think twice now next time but uh yeah the mounties always get their man there you go he said it he said the thing yeah it said the thing it might take them some time but they'll get there <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you so much for listening guys uh, i really appreciate you guys great um yeah here listen next episode next episode of Dash chapter podcast keith will be joining uh, me for the next one as always that'll be out uh next week i think next let's do a spooky one. Oh yeah i want to do um maybe a Perhaps, perchance, a paranormal story or something. I don't know. Something a bit creepy. Come on, something a bit fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, here, listen. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Check out everything that chapter if you want. And um, yeah, hey, I love you. Keith loves you too. I do. All yeah. right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. I don't say enough. Yeah, yeah you don't. <laughs> you can tell me again if you want to. Yeah. Nah. All right. <laughs> I love you. I love you. Okay. <laughs> Bye, guys.